Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Designing on the Front Lines. This is our seventh episode of the show. This show is brought to you by the Health Design Lab at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and Cooper Hewitt at the Smithsonian Museum. I'm Morgan Hutchinson. And I'm Matt Fields, and we are two emergency medicine doctors joined by our team and co-sponsors from the Health Design Lab, Bon Ku, Rob Buglese, Christy Shine, Mary Ellen Daly, Michelle Ho, and all of our students who are tuning in today. Hey, guys, thanks for coming on. And also from Cooper, Cooper Hewitt, Ellen Lupton, and Pam Horn. It's a very important day today, Juneteenth, which in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and weeks of protesting of racism around the world makes this Juneteenth even more critical to remember our country's long battle with racism and how this battle is far from over. I was really moved by a talk on our show on June 5th by Brian Lee Jr. who talked about how we can use design as a form of protest when imagining the design of our cities, spaces, and institutions. Mid-June also marks the fourth month of the pandemic, and unfortunately, we have seen some spikes this week. Four states have actually reported record high numbers of COVID cases, and over half of the states in the U.S. have reported increasing numbers throughout this week. We created Designing on the Front Lines to bring together people from the world of design and medicine to reimagine how we deliver healthcare in the setting of the pandemic. And today, I'm really excited to hear from our speakers. Yeah, so let's get to it. Um, so remember, and for those of you joining for, this for the first time, this is meant to be an interactive discussion and we really wanna see your faces. So please turn your video on. Uh, use the chat box to tell us who you are, where you're from, and ask questions. And uh, Christy Shine will be monitoring those questions and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. And then if you've missed any of our previous episodes, you wanna check them out, they're available online at healthdesignlab.com slash D-O-T-F-L. We've got four excellent speakers today, Norma Padrone, health economist, Yuhan Sonin, who's the director of Go Invo, designer, Dr. Emily Silverman, who's a doctor in internal medicine and the creator of the Nocturnist podcast, and Dr. James Pinkney, who's the CEO of Diamond Physicians and a physician on Chasing the Cure. We also have one themed breakout room, surprise, to follow. It's going to be a five to six minute breakout room with four to six randomly assigned co-members, and that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to turn it over to our producer and Zoom bouncer, Rob Puglisi, for music updates. What's up, everybody? It's great to see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new ones as well this week. Um, every week, I like to give a little uh, talk about the music that we started at the beginning of the, of the episode. Uh, this week, uh, this was actually, it was pretty sweet music, but it comes from an even sweeter show. Um, one of the things as a parent of three little, uh, very energetic girls is I love getting them to calm down by sticking in front of the TV and sitting right down next to them. So, uh, co-watching is really a huge thing for me. So whenever I find a show that we can both watch, um, it's amazing. So that song that you heard today came from a really fantastic show called Kipo and the Age of the Wonder Beasts. Uh, if you got kids or even if you don't, you just like watching cartoons like I do. Uh, I suggest you check it out. Amazing animation, amazing team of producers and actors, and the, the songs are incredible. So check it out. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. All right, so let's get into it. So one thing that we haven't talked about on this show is the impact of COVID-19 on the economy. Fortunately, our first guest today is a health economist and expert in healthcare research. Norma Padron, or uh, Dr. Padron, has expertise in healthcare economics and healthcare research with over a decade of experience in academia and healthcare analytics. After tr transitioning from academia to health systems, she is currently working to accelerate the role of digital technologies in healthcare deliveries. Her focus is on the application of research principles to improve the design, implementation, and evaluation of digital project, pro uh, products to advance health. Uh, Norma, uh, it's great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone, from the invitation. I am going to be sharing my screen. And so, there we go. So for today, um, I wanted to go over, uh, sorry, get off this end. I wanted to go over, rather than make it a very sort of professionally focused conversation, just sort of some reflections of things that I've learned over the years and things that I worked on over the years. Um, and so as many of you, I have spent a lot of time indoors and so reflecting in terms of what uh, time and place and space means, uh, means to me, to my work. And so I will, I will focus on that. Um, I will be going over an article that I published earlier this year. Um, but everything in the context of personal reflection. So once we get into the questions, I would love to kind of hear your reactions on that. 
So I will begin by saying that I did spend some time as Jefferson faculty in 2014, 2016. So I consider myself an adopted gang uh, member of the health design lab. Um, and uh, because a lot of my work has focused on uh, or rather has been influenced by the places that I've lived, I, Philadelphia holds a very special place in my heart. Um, and so here it is. So this slide says that it's a little bit about me, but really this whole presentation is about me and my reflections and my experience, which are um, in, no small uh, is in no small part shaped by uh, where I'm from. So I'm from a very small town in Southeast Texas called McAllen, Texas. And so this is Shelby Me, um, and this is my hometown. And in 2009, as I was embarking to begin my PhD to become a health economist, and it was such an exciting time in my life, this article in The New Yorker came out uh, called The Cost Conundrum. And this Texas town that Atul Gawande was talking about, where healthcare expenditures were so high and healthcare access so low, um, was my hometown. And so I remember just sort of getting that sense of that ominous feeling um, that I was embarking into this adventure to understand healthcare, and and yet this is where I was where I was from. So I've lived in over time in twelve different cities in four different countries, and um, throughout very early on, I started focusing on health and healthcare, and so um, in these different places and cities that I've lived, it's been very salient how. Uh, both access uh, and um, the experience of healthcare is so different and so marked by the places where we live. So a lot of my work um, has been focused on two different intersections. I, I have been told more than, more than I would like to share uh, that I need to focus a little bit more in terms of my interests, but, but I, I don't want to. And so um, a lot of my work uh, in the past has focused on that intersection between public health and healthcare delivery and really partnering with local public health departments like the Department of Public Health in San Antonio and Philadelphia and Barcelona and um, healthcare systems and providers in terms of understanding how they design services for, for their patients. And the other intersection that I've been interested on over the years, um, and again, the sort of, as I look at sort of these publications or this work, these projects that I've done, they all were in different cities and different places. So they all kind of have been colored by that experience. Um, but I've been very interested in the intersection of behavioral economics and population health. And all of this can become like really catchy words that carry different meanings to different people. But I think like one constant of all of this work is that we always kind of converge into something like this, right? Like we end up with one map. This is a map that I built as a dashboard, an interactive tool that I built back when I was in Philadelphia, and this is Philadelphia. And for example, like we know those statistics by heart. Uh, we know that, you know, on one side of the main line, the income is really, really high and health outcomes are really positive and, and on the other side is really negative. And, and the same applies, this is Barcelona. This is the index of family income in Barcelona. This is housing inequality in Durham, North Carolina, where I also live. And then this is from the article that I published with some colleagues in and January at uh, JAMA, um, where again, sort of it is true for the US. And so I, in the last three months, when I think of sort of like, what does the place means to the work that I've conducted over the years, um, I, I have more questions than answers, but I think that, you know, population health and, you know, behavioral economics and public health, they all seem to converge to something um, where we, we come to understand these inequalities at the geographic level. And so this is back to my hometown, and this is the article that I was mentioning that I published in January with some colleagues. And so I wanted to actually, let me see if I can move this here. Yeah, I wanted to actually take you to the, to the map itself and just sort of show you, I, I do invite you to rebuild this SDOH atlas github.io. I do invite you to go and play with it. We focused on these dimensions, which again, in reflecting in the last three months, sort of they, they, they hold now a, a very interesting meaning, but socioeconomic advantage, limited mobility, urban core opportunity, 
mixed immigrant cohesion, cohesion and accessibility. And I'm speaking today from LA, so I can walk you through some of our thinking here in LA. So for example, uh, poverty, 26.2% of poverty, 6.3% unemployment, 26.3% of you know, high school per capita income, minority, and the, an advantage index, which is negative. And, and again, I, you can play with this. And the reason why I call this, this conversation reflections is because I guess over the last decade that I've been working in this space, I, I, I used to think that I understood it that much better. Um, and I've come now to realize, uh, especially in light of uh, some of the events that, we, that we've had and certainly the pandemic, um, just sort of what does it all mean in terms of action? And so back to just sort of the, some of the, the topics is that, you know, hometown and our place and our space means different things. And it's certainly, we understand that it affects health, um, but how do we change these numbers? I think that is what I'm hopefully gonna be spending the next decade professionally on. And so to conclude, so McAllen, which was the, the place, my hometown, is where I spent the last three months prior to flying back to LA uh, with my mom. We were socially distanced, um, appreciating parks and sidewalks and cooking and baking like most people in these last few months. And um, I've gained just sort of this, this newly just impetus and, and energy towards um, spending the next decade of my my professional trajectory not building only the maps but hopefully building the actions to change the maps and so i will conclude i will still if i still have it morgan do i still have one more minute i will conclude with because they did say i was very grateful that in the invitation it said you can share personal reflections and poetry and i thought poetry can we do that um so i, I don't write poetry but i do love reading it and like i said my work uh, I've been putting a lot of my work in perspective, and um, I love this little poem came out recently, uh, or that I came across recently. It's called Time Pummels by Gregory Orr. Um, so I'll just read it. Uh, Time pummels the whole globe with catastrophe and weather. Why be surprised? It also tests poems. So what if it's old? What if it's been wept over for centuries? Notice not a single phrase is blurred on the page. Here they are, words, arranged in hopeful lines, patient as seeds in their furrows. What is your voice, if not the rain? So, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Norma. That was really moving, and I'm really excited to uh, look at that um, Social Determinants of Health Atlas. That's really cool. So uh, I'm going to uh, hand off now to our co-sponsor of the show, Ellen Lupton, who is the senior curator of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum, who's going to introduce our next guest. Ellen? Yeah, great. I'm really excited to meet, to introduce uh, Yuhan Sonin, who I got to work with on our book, Health Design Thinking, which is full of infographics and UX designs created by his company, GoInvo, which is located in Boston and is helping build the future of healthcare. Um, the design skills in this company range from medical illustration to data visualization and UX. They design information products and even policies. So I'm really excited to hear uh, Yuhan and the incredible range of thought and making and doing that he brings to the design of healthcare. Thank you. Welcome, Yuhan. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. I can't live up to that at all. Um, so <laughs> let me start uh, by saying, yes, I do. Uh, uh, pretend to run a company in Arlington. I also teach at an academic institution that's also a, a, a venture capital firm in Cambridge. Um, with ethics is situationally optional in most of industry, including healthcare at the moment. Here are my disclosures. Yes, all of my genome and public and uh, personal health is on GitHub, so do what you will. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I will try to get back to you within two business hours, uh, and there you can publicly shame me on Twitter. So, this is a noble pursuit that we are, most of us are in, uh, the world of healthcare. And here we are in the Declaration of Geneva, some 70 years ago, with an excellent 
way of thinking about what we should be doing for everyone in it. And yet we are bombarded by, yeah, my algorithm, my model care plans for half the US citizens. Good luck trying to get into it and see how it works. Um, we th I think we think more than it is, but we're inching towards healthcare as a human right. And yet when you use a healthcare service, you have no idea how the thing works. None, zero typically. And that to me is a crime against patients and clinicians. Because if healthcare is so noble, if it is critical to how we operate here on the planet, we don't have a choice in this country either. I demand that healthcare be open. So look, the underpants of the internet uh, are inherently open, right? It's also a human right, says the UN, and most of us are using it right now. Uh, and if you check your phones, the devices you're on right now, most of the infrastructure of that software is open source. And yet when you go longitudinally up and down the stack, of the software stack at least in healthcare, uh, it sure as hell is not open, it's all closed. And Eric here says we have anti-open source in healthcare. So, uh, yes, we have plenty of people on high making sure that they hear, we hear the story, probably not loud enough. So, where is open source healthcare sort of best suited for? Well, one is the infrastructure, these common services that we all sort of use and use again and again and again and again. And the other part is the bleeding edge of healthcare. That's the bleeding edge of science. These two places are really good for it. And you can see the infrastructure part of my whole land of Estonia is, uh, which is sort of crazy, they have this kind of electronic um, goodness in, countrywide, but their entire backbone is open source. And so, uh, and I know the WHO and the UN love to quote uh, Estonia's experience there. They have problems too, but this is a good example to look at for infrastructures all open. And yeah, US is getting there. The rest of the planet is making nibbles uh, at open source. You probably heard of fire and some other techniques here that are all mostly open source. And yet here we are in, in the midst of uh, craziness. And this is also a very good time to see how open source is helping everyone. NIH, blasting out material all the time. The VSAC, uh, it sounds like a, a condition I don't want to have. Uh, it's, it talks about the, these are all the definitions for the data. Uh, for COVID, for instance, it's all open source and accessible, interrogatable. You're seeing it in your news streams, right? Open source, open source. Uh, hell, if you go to GitHub, which is a repository for code, you have 32,000 repos. Holy smokes. You know, a date picker has like 5,000. So there's something good happening here. And uh, our studio, all of the things we do internally are open source, like uh, for kids and teenagers, understanding coronavirus.org is a graphic uh, novella. Home Care Basics is translated into a couple languages. HGraph on COVID, all open source. And what we're fighting for and continue to fight for at the state level and national level is how do patients start to co-own the data? Again, open source. And so here's an, a, an excellent coalition that's also jamming on this and even has it in their mantra. Our stuff is open source. Okay, pretty damn good. But we're not close. We're really not close because eventually a vaccine is going to show up and guess who's going to make a shit ton of money. That's a technical term on a taxpayer funded exhibit, right? In pharma, about 70% of taxpayer dollars are the thing that drives development. And so maybe we don't get marching rights, but we sure as heck should have uh, some kind of three year limit and a percent markup on the vaccine. We have to think about this globally and as a system problem. And so as designers and, and, and engineers and healthcare wonks, uh, there is also part of us that need to look at what are all the things we demand of the healthcare system to and how should it evolve? And yes, you know, some of these things we as a studio have worked on uh, here and we also have our own objectives, uh, making sure that again, patients are part of the equation by owning their data. And then one, of course, I'm, you know, channeling my uh, Ralph Nader here, we need a sort of a health literacy agency for ourselves. Um, and to wrap up, I think that healthcare is a public utility. It is a human right, and it is way too important to be closed. And we as engineers, as designers, as clinicians, as policy makers, really need to do a better job in understanding that there's not much choice here and if there is going to be involvement by us, it should sure as hell be open. I've stolen from most of these people here. 
And if you want to hear some of my or read some of my more ranting, uh, go for it at opensourcehealthcare.org. Thank you so much, Johan. That was awesome. It was really great. I'm excited to read more about that. And I love what you said about open source medicine. It's like so true and so uh, elegant. Um, I'm now going to go ahead and introduce our first and only breakout room of the day. This is going to be a six minute breakout room and we're going to randomly assign you to groups of four to six people. This is going to be prompted with the following question. Who has inspired you during the pandemic? This could be anybody. This could be a designer, a healthcare worker, a patient, a leader, activist, a friend, colleague, family member, anybody. Who has inspired you during the pandemic? That was an awesome, awesome breakout room, you guys. Thank you so much. We met people from Arizona, Texas, Seattle, that's where I'm from, up in Canada, and then actually had my first breakout room where Bon and I were in the same room, so that was pretty cool too. Yeah, we ran out of time. Oh my gosh. Ran out. I know we did yeah. too. That was great. Oh my gosh. Thanks to Ellen Lupton for that awesome prompt. That was definitely um, taking it uh, the next step. I think we're going to keep you on that uh, assignment, Ellen. Um, and Colleen Clark gave us some great options too for breakout rooms. So you guys, man, bringing the designers into those questions. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. I'm so excited to have Dr. Emily Silverman here. She's an internal medicine doctor and she is the creator of the podcast, The Nocturnist. Storytelling is something that is already known to be so important in the world of design, but it's something that's very underutilized in the world of medicine. There are not a lot of options for doctors and nurses to tell their stories about their patient experiences. We have plenty of Grey's Anatomy, but not a lot of The Nocturnist. And Emily Silverman, thank you so much for joining us today. I am going to share my screen while I speak, and I will hand it over to you. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Morgan, and thank you everybody for having me. It's such a dynamic group of people all tackling such important problems in healthcare, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think uh, Morgan should be sharing a couple of images uh, in a minute, and while she's getting those up, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the project that I've been working on over the last uh, really 12 weeks um, which is an audio documentary series called uh, Stories from a Pandemic. And in essence, over the last 12 weeks, we have received over 700 audio clips from healthcare workers across North America. Uh, 700 clips total uh, amounting to 250, roughly, healthcare workers across America uh, about their experience taking care of COVID patients, dealing with COVID, the emotional impact, the logistical impact. And, you know, it's just been some of the most raw tape that I've ever heard. And so I want to share more with you about that project and how it came to be. But in order to understand that, I wanted to walk it back a little bit and share with you the, the history of the organization, uh, which is called The Nocturnus. And it's a medical storytelling community uh, that I founded in January 2016 when I was a medical resident at UCSF. And really, the Nocturnus was born out of my personal pit of burnout and depression. Um, I don't know if there are a lot of docs in this conference right now, but physician burnout, physician depression, even physician suicidality has been a big uh, topic over the last few years. And I was definitely experiencing a lot of burnout when I was in residency. And I think a lot of that was related to how the human stories and the human interaction was really being stripped out of the experience of doctoring. And I was spending a lot of my time in front of the computer and not in front of my patient. Um, and also just the brutal hours. I felt like parts of myself was falling away, like relationships and hobbies that I used to do. I just like, it was like, oh, I haven't picked up my guitar in like two years. Where did the time go? Um, and one of the parts of myself that I felt was dying was actually my creative side, which is unfortunate because I feel like there's so much room for creativity in medicine, but I just felt like I was kind of stuck in this box of the epic check boxes and the algorithms and, um, didn't really feel like I had any space to play or explore or really like process and metabolize a lot of what I was seeing unfold in front of me in the hospital, um, which included moments of joy and healing, but also moments of um, just uh, devastation, you know, dealing with illness and grief and things like that. So 
I decided that I was going to start a live storytelling show. And so this podcast was actually a live show before it was a podcast. And so in January 2016, I basically twisted the arms of eight of my colleagues and got them to go on stage and tell stories about their lives as doctors. And there was this electricity in the air. And uh, fast forward four years, um, the last live show that we did pre-COVID was in uh, January of this year, or maybe February, I can't remember the exact date, but it was at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, and we had an audience of 700 people, a sold out theater, um, people coming to the theater to hear doctors stand on stage and talk about their experience. And to really speak from a place of vulnerability, I think part of what I'm trying to do with this project is shatter the illusion of the physician god or the physician hero or the physician soldier, which is a narrative that's been splashed around a lot in the media these days. And so we were kind of going along with these live shows and then we would take the stories from the live show and release them on the podcast coupled with a conversation between me and the storyteller. And that's what we were doing. And then in March, COVID hit and we just stopped everything because we understood that the medical community needed us more in that moment than ever before. And we tried a few different things. First, we said, you know, send us uh, your COVID stories. And we got, you know, a couple dozen stories and they were written and they were fine, but they didn't have that magic. And then we said, okay, send us audio clips. You know, we've always been about the spoken word. Send us audio clips. We got some audio clips and they were okay. And I think part of what we realized is that in the past, we had asked people to craft like a perfect 10 minute story uh, with, you know, an opening scene and conflict and stakes and a climax and a resolution. And people just didn't have time to do that because there was a pandemic. They were dealing with other issues. So we then pivoted to this diary format, and that is really where things exploded. Um, once we launched it as a diary project, over 50 healthcare workers signed up within 24 hours, and then eventually we got over 250 people to sign up, and we, we had people send us over 700 clips. And it's, you know, today's March 15th, I'm Dr. So-and-so, I work at this hospital, and this is what happened today. And basically we produced this in the style of Saturday Night Live where um, every week on Tuesday we would release an episode and then the clock would reset. And then we would say, okay, um, what came in last week and what is the next episode gonna be? And so we were really just churning out these episodes um, based on the moment. And I think um, it had a really natural arc because we started with uh, the hitting of the pandemic, the surprise, and then up to the surge and then to sort of, um, figuring things out and all the logistical issues and then the emotional fallout. And so I'm starting to get to my time, but if you're interested in hearing some of this audio, um, you can visit our website, The Nocturnist. Um, we have 10 podcast episodes that you can check out or you can interact with this, which is our um, story map where we have um, dots on the map. These are not all of our stories. We just, we curated this pretty carefully. So these dots represent all of the stories that made it onto the podcast. And you can click and you can hear voices from around the country. And I should say, it's not just doctors. We also have nurses, we have a hospital chaplain, we have a medical delivery truck driver. We have all sorts of different healthcare workers who are sharing their stories, reflections and reactions to the pandemic. And we stopped after episode 10, but we are planning to launch a, a part two. Uh, we just don't know when that's going to be or what that's going to look like, but we are very committed to kind of sticking with this narrative and exploring the fallout and how this can be a portal to a better moment in healthcare. So I'll stop there. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Emily. That was awesome. I'm really excited to hear from you. I love your podcast. It's like, oh my God, just so beautiful and so well done. I would totally encourage everybody to check it out. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our Health Design Lab Director, Dr. Bon Koo, to introduce our last speaker. Hey, I'm Bon. I'm uh, going to introduce Dr. James Pickney. I don't see him. Where are you? Are you on here, James? I'm below you. I'm still in your no, shadow. Oh, there you I'm go. There you face. go. <laughs> I'm still living in your shadow. You're not chasing the cure for six months. <laughs> <laughs> well, James is a he's a good friend, and he is a family physician. He's practicing. He's also an entrepreneur, one of the most creative guys that I know. He is CEO of a company called Diamond Physicians. They're based in Dallas, Texas, and it, 
he has this amazing story of how he started this um, company. We've had a lot of conversations together in Los Angeles in a television studio when we were doing a show called Chasing the Cure uh, that helped patients get a diagnosis. So um, I was always freaking out in the back room before going on set and just having a nervous breakdown. And James was so cool, calm, and collective. And I was like, I want to be like James when, when I grow up. <laughs> Um, and I, and I just had some, um, we're going to just, uh, maybe chat James. I, w I wanted to get your thoughts on, 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 a few things. You know, one is in Texas, we've been seeing a increasing number of case COVID cases there and wondering how you as a physician, as a CEO of a company, um, is, um, how have you been adapting to that? And, and another question I have is, um, you know, we've talked a lot about race and medicine dur during our conversations uh, last year, and we currently are not only experiencing a viral pandemic, but really a, a, a racial pandemic within a viral pandemic. Um, and what has your experience been like as a uh, black physician during during this time? So th there's a sure. couple of questions I'll throw to you, and um, yeah. Well, thank you for that, that introduction, Vaughn. Um, I appreciate the invite from the Health Design Lab and uh, really excited to be on the show today. Uh, the first question, Vaughn, you know, Texas is really challenging, right? Because you're, you're mixing politics with medical policy and they don't, and they don't mix. So uh, we opened up our state, in my opinion, way too fast. Uh, our numbers weren't declining. declining. We weren't following the, the CDC recommendations and our governor just said, hey, look, I don't care. We're gonna open up the state uh, in phases. And sure enough, uh, Texas, Florida, Arizona, uh, all three who reopened the states, in my opinion, too fast, have experienced exponential um, growth in COVID-19 cases. We, we we're up 50%, and each day this week, we've had record numbers of uh, COVID-19 positives and hospitalizations, and, and hospitals are at 75% capacity now. So, um, you know, COVID-19 is, is very serious, and, and it's, it's a pretty simple solution to stop the spread. You know, I just need everybody to wear one of these. You know, we, when we talk and we laugh and we cough, we're spewing respiratory droplets into the atmosphere. And if you wear a mask, and if everyone wears a mask, you're protecting yourself from everybody else. So um, you decrease the probability from, from about 19% to 3%, one to 3% if you wear a mask uh, from infecting someone if you're asymptomatic or symptomatic carrier. So um, to address your second question, Vaughn, we had a great little chat in the, in the, in the breakout session just now. Um, you know, we're, our country is experiencing a lot of social injustice and, and we've been experiencing not only racial inequality, but gender inequality and, and all kinds of inequality for, for a long time. And, and, and it's, since it's Juneteenth, it's kind of fitting that, I, that we talk a little bit about uh, my experience. You know, I, I've experienced racism um, as early as age 10, blatant racism being called uh, the N-word and, and, and things of that nature. And, and in the breakout session, I told a story about how when I was a resident at Cedar sinai uh, in LA, I was a surgery resident and then changed to family medicine. That's a long story. I was seeing a patient walk into the room and they literally told me to my face, I don't want uh, any colored, colored people on my team. I don't want a colored person taking care of me. And luckily my attending um, had my back and, and immediately said, we're not gonna tolerate any language like that. Uh, if you don't want Dr. Pinckney to be part of this team, you can uh, check out AMA. So uh, it's it's rampant in our country. I, I am hopeful that the the unfortunate uh, murder of George Floyd is facilitating change. I'm seeing a lot of things across the country that are inspiring and, and are true uh, reactions to to this this travesty and, and, and really sparking change. I mean, I've I've seen uh, companies. Um, institute policies. I've, I've had people reach out to me. So, you know, that's, um, that's a, a tough subject, Bond, but, but a good subject that we have to talk about. And um, it's, it's something that hopefully we can move forward and we can really come together as a country and, and promote equality. You know, we're all Americans here. There's, there's not 20 different races. There's only one race, the human race. And once we realize that, we can, we can move forward and become uh, a better nation. Uh, thanks, thanks, James. And I, wh what's it been like? You know, you, you own this company, um, and you're we're in this pandemic. The cases are increasing in Texas. How, how do you keep yourself safe, your family safe, your 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 staff safe? What what's that been like? 
Yeah, we, we've had devastating um, uh, lows in PPE. So I'm literally uh, stapling N95s. My strap broke and I had to staple it back together. Um, you know, from a, from a screening standpoint, you know, we are doing uh, PCR testing and antibody testing, but there's been so much just fraud out there, especially with antibody testing. You've had hundreds of companies jump into this pandemic and release um, antibody testing without evidence-based medicine, without proper data. And it just, they just want to make money and profit off of a pandemic. So it's been challenging sorting through all the, the mayhem. And I've got a team, I've got eight doctors that are on our team and one of them is a board certified pulmonologist. So we've been scouring the country for the best screening tests. Uh, and I'm really happy to announce that we found a viral antigen test made by a company called Quidel, who's been around for years, um, 30 years or so. And um, it's the first of its kind. Uh, they're the only test that has approved the FDA EUA approval. And um, you know, I don't know if anybody's had PCR testing on this call, the nasopharyngeal swab. It is miserable. I had to test myself, um, and it's not something that you want to do every week. Uh, it's 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 pretty rough. Um, PCR testing is great for symptomatic patients and still should be first line. It's got a high sensitivity, uh, very high specificity, and and for all the non physicians on the call. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. We actually take a little bit of that viral antigen from that nasal pharyngeal swab and we amplify it a hundred times. And then we compare that DNA and RNA to the actual COVID-19 strains and we see if they match. With the viral antigen testing that, I, that I've discovered, we actually, they actually have the antibody on the test kit. And it just takes a little bit of antigen on a nasal swab. So anterior nares, just the front part of the nose. So it's comfortable. Um, it, it's not miserable. They put that in the reagent, let it cure for a minute, then put it on, on, the, on the test kit, and the antigen actually binds to the antibody, and that's you, how you have a positive test. The sensitivities are above 90%, um, specificity is 100%, and I'm really excited about it. We're actually the first distributor um, in the country. We, we, we signed a deal with Quidel, and we're launching a COVID-19 screening program for universities, for NCAA universities, to get students back to school so we can reopen schools to get students back to sports so that we can have division one sports and division two sports in this country i think it's great for morale um, we've had a lot of a lot of bad things happen in the last couple months and people need uh, a boost and a break from from all the chaos and, and 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 all the pain and i think sports are a great way to do that so we're excited about the program um, we have 111 universities that have signed with us and we will be doing COVID-19 testing, screening for them. And we really believe that this is the best test for asymptomatic um, individuals who are gonna be the vast majority of students as well as people returning to work. So I think when we start opening the country up, we're gonna to have to have these programs and these protocols in place that we can safely reopen and make sure that we can, we can wear our masks, uh, our face coverings at all times and have adequate screening and we can actually beat this thing. Uh, you. You're doing some amazing stuff. Thank, thanks for your leadership there, there, James. And um, it's a uh, fan, fantastic and so great to reconnect again. Uh, it's been it's been a while. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, Bon. Morgan, are we all out of time? Me and James. Oh, we you talk, guys. Oh we my talk god. All, all night long, you know. Yeah, I can talk and, all day. Uh, <laughs> we can extend this, but we do uh, we do run a tight schedule around here, so I guess so. Um, James, thank you so much. That was really really cool to hear your own personal experience. And also, wow, that is absolutely incredible. The numbers you guys are getting with sensitivity and, you know, doing the anterior swab, that's like really incredible and way better than what we have available as anywhere I've heard. So that's great. Guys, this has been a great day. All four speakers were absolutely incredible. And I'm really excited to hear the questions the audience has for you guys. I'm going to turn it over to Christy Shine for the question and answer panel. Thank you, Morgan. Um, so we had some great questions pop up both in the chat box and then earlier this week from some of the friends of the show. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. There's a question for Emily. Emily, this question comes from Colleen Clark in our audience today. How might we, um, or, or, or what are the most surprising themes from the stories that you've received? And you know, how might we incorporate those into um, into our medical practice? Yeah, I, that's a great question. One of the analogies that's come up recently is that we have a healthcare system that is chronically ill 
and COVID has been the acute on chronic insult on our healthcare system. And so really what COVID has done is unmasked a lot of the issues that were already there. And so, um, you know, some of what we're hearing in these audio diaries is um, people not feeling valued at their institution, people not feeling seen, people not feeling like they've been communicated with effectively. Um, that's one part of it. Another theme that was really common is uh, the healing effect of laying hands of touch and how difficult that has been in a time of social, of social isolation. Um, we had one clip from a hospital chaplain in Indiana who was talking about how do you minister to a grieving family from a distance and you know shouting hail marys from a door and you know when you can't have a funeral like what is that grief process like when all the rituals around death are no longer accessible so that was an interesting theme that came up a lot um, another theme that came up a lot is the um the idea of the physician hero and uh, the way that the mass media was portraying physicians and a lot of medical students um, and doctors and nurses were just talking about how that didn't really resonate with them and how they felt like the inner experience of providing care to COVID patients was a lot more complex. Um, I heard a lot of guilt come up. So for every doctor who was at home feeling guilty that they weren't in the hospital taking care of COVID patients, there was a doctor wrapped in COVID uh, gear, intubating COVID patients who was guilty that they weren't helping out at home with the kids. So people feeling guilty sort of on all different angles of this. Um, but then there was also just a lot of beautiful moments of resilience and beautiful moments of connection and joy. I mean, even in a story of somebody holding up a cell phone and facilitating a goodbye, like it's an incredibly sad story, but there's a beauty there um, in that connection. So um, it's a mix. And uh, at some point, we'll probably have to write it all up and um, analyze it. But uh, for now, uh, the best way to hear it is just to hear it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, one uh, just further question building on that. How might we get a larger diversity of voices involved in this conversation? And how do we make sure that we're including all of the different voices that we all need to hear, especially in the light of all of the recent events that we've had? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's incredibly important that the physician workforce be diverse um, because people bring different perspectives to the table, but also our patients are diverse. And so I think it's important that the physician workforce reflect our patient population. Um, I remember once I was walking with uh, our chief of medicine at the general to the elevator and he's a black man. We were standing waiting for the elevator and a black woman came up to both of us and she looked at him and she said, are you a doctor? And he said, yes, I am. And she looked like she was about to cry. And she was like, I want you to be my doctor. And you could see how meaningful it was to her to see a black man in a white coat and that connection. And so I think it's incredibly important that we um, maximize the diversity of the physician workforce. And then as a storytelling organization, we feel really strongly that we want to highlight stories that aren't being told. And that certainly includes people who have been ex historically excluded. Um, I didn't mention this in my presentation, but in the wake of George Floyd's murder, we launched a new audio documentary series that's called um, Black Voices in Healthcare. Um, that series is gonna be hosted by physician Ashley McMullen at UCSF and executive produced by physician Kimberly Manning at Emory University. Um, both are um, black women physicians who are leaders in the medical humanities. And we've already had over 130 black healthcare workers across the states um, sign up to participate in that project. So that was a really deliberate step that we took as an organization to highlight the voices um, of you know, people of color. So it's something that is an ongoing iterative process and um, very important and I think ultimately will yield a much more interesting uh, landscape of stories and conversations. That's great. We'll certainly look forward to that. That's wonderful. Thanks for that. Um, next question is from Maya Friedman, and this question goes out to you, Han. Um, so aside from open source, the other half of the equation is getting diverse groups of people to donate data so that we're not just um, looking for patterns in a homogeneous data set. How does your company work through that issue? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, one that actually all of us which is the huge NIH funded research project uh, is tackling now, 
where they're not just looking for, they're looking for a representative sample of biologic, environmental, uh, and genomic uh, data from across the US. So they're doing much different techniques than I think uh, most people would think about in how to approach and find people uh, across the spectrum. And so I would look actually, I, they can answer it better than I can just by looking at how they approach getting samples and people to participate. It's really pretty brilliant. So I would look at all of us research project. They have a specific tenant as part of their getting our tax dollars to make sure that they get a representative sample. That's great, thanks. Um, another question coming out into the audience and this one is coming from, let's see, ooh, we lost the chat, um, sorry about that. Uh, question is coming from uh, one of our, our viewers from last week actually and this question is gonna go out to James. So this is from Andrea Bistini and she wants to know, how might the recent awakening over racial equality in this country be taken into account in order to specifically improve the health of black men and black women? You know, that's a great question. You know, with the, uh, you know, systemic oppression of black people uh, in America for, for decades, it's gonna be a really hard, hard task. There's food deserts in black and Latino um, neighborhoods. There's um, so many areas of underserved where there's just no hospitals and no access to healthcare. And one of the things that I'm doing at Diamond Physicians is is building clinics in these areas to provide access to care um, for underserved communities. Um, so I think impact funds are going to be critical. We have an impact fund that we're trying to set up um, in, in, in the the um, social unrest and, and the murder of George Floyd and all these things are actually facilitating change. And companies are reaching out to us because there's actually a lot of a lot of capital out there that needs to be redirected to social impact funds. And, and I think that's a way that we can start facilitating change. Great. Thank you so much for that. And um, another question, uh, this time we'll switch over to Norma to make sure we're getting everybody's questions answered. So Norma, a question for you is, how might we incorporate creativity to drive home um, the public health crisis and potential solutions to it using some of the map-based techniques you talked about? So that's, uh, that's a really good question. I think that just speaking from my personal experience and training, um, it actually, it came until very late, later in my, in my trajectory uh, an experience that I that I incorporated any creativity. It's almost when I look back at it, I almost feel like I don't know that anyone explicitly said it, but I think it was almost discouraged um, in some way, like as if objectivity was at odds with creativity. Um, and so I think that uh, I would I would advise, and and I've done so, and sort of when I've interacted with students or or other people that are earlier on in their training to be more intentional and mindful about incorporating that aspect. I, I do think that it detracts instead of, um, instead of becoming more objective, which it may, again, the, the, you don't lose objectivity by bringing creativity, but creativity allows the space to ask questions that you might otherwise not be willing to ask or, or be afraid to ask. And so it's um, about owning the space and owning the, the you know, the, the knowledge that you're trying to seek, the information you're trying to prove. So I will say um, it is not necessarily, it hasn't been my experience that universities teach it very intentionally, at least not in the economics or public health realm. I think more and more Jefferson is one of them, thanks to Bond and others. Um, but I would, I would just sort of leave it at the students themselves and people that are requiring, you know, requiring that training or are embarking their research projects to be mindful and intentional about it. Yeah, I love that. I love what you just said about um, the creativity and object objectivity not actually being at odds with one another. That's something we do try to get across in the health design lab, and so we love that you uh, that you support that theme and and uh, and think about that in your research as well. So uh, thank you to all of our speakers. We had so many great questions. Thank you to the audience members. Please feel free weekly to put your questions in the chat and. Um, hopefully we can get them all answered by our speakers. So I'm going to turn it back over to Morgan. Absolutely. Thank you all, Chrissy. Lovely. And um, thank you all for your presentations and for your answers to all these questions. If you guys missed any part of this show or any of the prior shows, 
You can check them out at healthdesignlab.com slash D-O-T-F-L. This was a great week. Um, it's going to be a tough act to follow, but we do have another show coming next week that you guys will hear about. We've got three excellent speakers. We have the founder, one of the founding members of the IDEO firm, Dennis Boyd. We have healthcare architect from one of the leading architecture firms, Sheila Rudder, and we have designer um, Emma Greer. So I'm hoping to see you guys all then, and I will send it back okay. to Rob for some music. <laughs> all right, that was awesome, everybody. Thanks, thanks to all our speakers. Thank that was you. really cool. Everybody have a great weekend.